Hello, everyone. Um, I want to uh, thank you for coming to uh, the Q&A session for uh, the short film Against the Wall. Today we have with us uh, Kim Holland and Kevin Foster. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to let them uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Kim, do you want to go first and then Kevin can go next? So I was just saying earlier that I'm a producer okay. of Against the Wall and I've worked in Hollywood and the film industry for more than 10 years, both in film and investment and also in cultural exchange and producing uh, film and documentary. I hope you, uh, I hope you like uh, everybody that was watching. I hope you enjoyed the story. And um, it's, it's, it's been a lifelong journey. And that particular tour of Cycling the Great Wall uh, dramatically changed my life for the better. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, this shirt was very inspirational uh, to watch. Um, you know, uh, from the short, you can see that you have not only inspired many others, but you've inspired, uh, you know, different sports even, you know, uh, in the short, they talked about how you're one of like the pioneers of, uh, you know, doing extreme sports before it was even, a, a, you know, a real thing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, definitely very inspiring. Um, so to start off this Q&A, I wanted to quickly uh, give Kim a, a chance to maybe talk about, you know, what inspired you to spearhead and create uh, this short film. Um, you know, there are interviews, obviously there were a lot of footages from way back in the years. Uh, what was what was that process like? Um, when did you start and how do we get to today? <laughs> okay, so yeah. years back, I met Kevin in Beijing and uh, he was out there talking to China Film Group about turning his story into a feature film. So Kevin and I had been working on uh, getting support to make a feature film out of his story. And then I happened to be out in Beijing at another point in time and was asked to give a talk to Chinese uh, directors and other filmmakers about uh, film investment in the US. Mm. So in the course of giving that talk, somebody asked me what would make a good US China co-production, what kind of story? Do you have some examples? And I said, oh, okay, well, and I told him Kevin's story and a director who was there said, came up to me later and she said, you know, it can take a long time to get a film made and you always have to think about how much of the story you can actually tell and those kinds of things. So. She said, I think it would be really important for you to go interview the people who were part of Kevin's story growing up and during the ride. And because a lot of them too were getting older and get them on film and get a record of their perception of his story. So she said, uh, I would be willing to give you some seed money to do a documentary. And so... <laughs> We were not planning to do a documentary, um, but I called Kevin and I said, guess what? We're doing a documentary. <laughs> and, so, and so we decided, originally we were thinking of doing a feature documentary, but since we were also working on uh, getting a feature film produced, we thought it would be better to do a short documentary and give the highlights of the story. Nice. Um, so, uh, uh, so the remaining questions I have for Kevin. Sure. Um, <laughs> yes, um, it's his story. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, your teacher said uh, he gave you that assignment to watch the TV um, and you saw the Great Wall and you said you wanted to ride your bike on that Great Wall. What was it about that footage of Nixon in China or seeing the Great Wall probably probably for the first time, I would assume back then. Um, what, what, what was it about that Great Wall that attracted you and planted that dream in your mind? Well, I, I remember it. Um, I mean, it was so vivid. Uh, well, well, one thing, the vividness was 
uh, oh, homework, you know, we have to watch TV, you know, no, right. So that was a great, I mean, anytime you can, you can watch TV as a homework assignment, that's, that's like the best. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't care what it was. I just didn't have to read or write. So, um, uh, so it's like, okay, you know, let's see it. So it's the first time uh, I knew about China, first time to see the Chinese people. Um, this was back in January of 73. And, uh, you know, when Nixon, President Nixon was on that wall. Now, <clears throat> going back, as it says in the story, going back, I was electrocuted, mm -hmm. uh, 65,000 volts, 30 amps, went through the course of my body, came out of my body. So I was pretty much jello and I was in a wheelchair for years. I had just, I was just pretty much out of a wheelchair. And for Christmas, a month before, I received a bicycle with training wheels. And so there's the bike with the training wheels. And now here's the TV uh, and, and uh, President Nixon and uh, Zhao Enlai and going, and, and there's the Great Wall of China. And it's like snaking. And to me, it just looked like a bicycle path. And that's just mm. what it looked like, you know. Snake. And so there's the Great Wall. There's the bike. There's the Great, you know, and you just go and like, I want to ride my bike on that thing. Man. I, I don't, you know, I just, I want to do it. I want to sleep in the towers. I want to, I want to do all that. And so, um, so I asked my mother, well, if I want to do something like really big, what do you think I should do? She said like, what? Well, I like, if I want to go to the moon, what, what, what would I have to do? And she said, well, if you want something to do really big, you should ask the most important person. And that would be the president of the United States. So I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I wrote, and I didn't tell anybody this, um, but I, I wrote to Nixon. And then I thought, you know, I should write to Chairman Mao too. You know, you're asking these two people as a 12-year-old kid, can I ride my bicycle on the Great Wall? Okay, so I didn't hear from Mao, Chairman Mao. But I did hear from Nixon six months later. However, after I did it and I mailed the letters... Uh, you know, you sit around the table at dinner time and you talk during dinner, the family. And uh, so I was very excited about that. And I said, guess what I did, you know, and I did this and my father just, man, he just blew up. He, are you crazy? And I, I, I got a beating for that. And I was sent to my room for the weekend. And, uh, you know, my father's blaming my mother. Look what your son did. What an embarrassment. He just embarrassed us. Um, that sort of thing. And, but, but uh, six months later, when I received a package from the White House, White House stationery material about China, oh man, you know, I was like, oh, and a picture of uh, Nixon and Mao shaking hands, the famous picture, which wow. I still have, which we show, I think we showed in the documentary. And um, which was really cool because after I came back from China, I, I sent Nixon, um, a photo of me cycling the Great Wall saying, you know, you mm -hmm. sent me a photo 20 years ago and here I, you know, I'm sending you one now and that's in the Nixon library. And um, so when I got that, then I guess my father was like, wow, my son got, you know, an answer from the White House, that sort of thing. But it fueled, it fueled the fire to uh, maybe someday I, I could do it. It just took a really long time mm. to get the permission from the Chinese government. Uh, so going off of that, can you talk a little bit more about that process of you getting that letter from Nixon and how you actually ended up at the Great Wall to be able to ride your bike? You know, in the documentary, you mentioned um, uh, Chris Dodd in National yeah. Ge Geography um, helping to get you that permission. You also mentioned that, you know, you spent 18 years studying the Great Wall. So can, can you talk a little bit more about that process leading up to that moment when you finally made it to the Great Wall with your bike? Well, sure. Um, I, I basically failed the, the school assignment um, <clears throat> after, the, you know, the next day. Uh, what did you get out of it? Okay, class, what did you get out? Oh, the Chinese. Oh, they're so fascinating. Oh, the country and all that. And I'm like, man, I want to ride my bike on the Great Wall of China. That's it. Okay, that's an F. Okay, flunk that one. Uh, flunk Aww. that class. But, um, but it, it, it just inspired me so much that I, I, I became crazy. Okay, I became mm. crazy. I go to the library. Um, there were not a lot of books on China. Uh, really nothing on China. Um, so I started 
contacting National Geographic uh, mm -hmm. Society in Washington, D.C. And what's really cool about that for a kid is that National Geographic has a 1-800 number. So it doesn't cost you anything. You know, you can like make, oh man, this is a free phone call. And I would <laughs> call them and then they would send me material about uh, the Chinese culture and about the country and, you know, all these facts. And then eventually I would find books about maybe the Great Wall or just the country itself. Because I just wanted to, to know everything I could about China and the Chinese people. And I just really from afar, you know, I, I just fell in love with the country and the people. And uh, I, I just knew after all that studying, I just knew that that when I eventually got there, I, I would be right at home. And he even um, gave his dogs Chinese names. Yes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's true. Um, I, I, uh, I had a Pekingese, Pekingese dog and I'm like, I, I named him uh, Kansu or Gansu. Yeah. Gansu. Uh, yeah, I got to, uh, that was my, that, he was my pet, you know, uh, so that's how crazy I was about this, and, and, and eventually over the years, um, for instance, uh, I, I, I contacted China in 1976, oops, Mao died, not a good time, okay, uh, tried again in 1980, oop, gang of four trials, not a good time, okay, so I, I just kept going for it and, and I kept reading about China. Finally, I was in the library and I was looking at a travel book of China. Mm -hmm. And I said, and it said in there that skateboarding is now allowed on the Great Wall of China. I, mean, I went to the, now I'm very familiar with the Chinese consulate in New York City. And uh, I, I think they're a little more familiar with me. I'm just this crazy American. And, um, and I'm like, is this true? And they said, yes. And I said, well, you know, a skateboard has four wheels and a bicycle only has two wheels. So why don't we, you know, try to do this? so they were like, well, maybe now is the time. And I couldn't get anywhere, uh, you know, with the permit. And we were having problems trying to get the permit from the Chinese government. And uh, my friend Tom Williams, who was in the documentary, he was mm -hmm. a political speech writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in Washington, D.C. And he told me something. This was very valuable. He said, he said, Kevin, you see, people think you're crazy because you are crazy, <laughs> but you need someone that has power behind you. Then you won't be thought of as so crazy. And I go, oh, OK, so who do we get? And I said, you know, I don't know anybody. And Tom was like, Kevin, are you kidding me? You're you're on the streets. You, you're a street person, you know, you, you know, a lot of people. And I didn't really think about it. But then as we started talking, I said, Oh, you know, when I was a boy, there was this guy, he was running for senator in my state. And, uh, and, and I helped at, I was whatever, 13 years old or something, but I was at his headquarters stuffing envelopes uh, for him, you, you know, for his campaign, and he won. And uh, so I, I was helping him uh, during that time. And so I, I, at that point, I knew him like half my life mm -hmm. and his name was Chris Dodd and Tom was Chris Dodd, Kevin, do you know who he is? I said, well, yeah, he's my Senator. I mean, I'm, I've known Chris for 14 years. And, and, uh, Tom was like, he's the head of the foreign relations committee to China. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, so we'll call him up and ask him to write you a letter. And I'm like, really? And, Tom said, okay. So I, I called Chris and I said, would you write a letter for me to cycle the Great Wall of China? And he said, Kevin, that's the craziest idea I've ever heard. You know what? Yeah, I'll write you a letter. Let's see how far you can get with it. I'm like, okay. And then I was talking about National Geographic that ever since I was a boy, I would call National Geographic on that, one, that beautiful 1-800 free toll call, you know, and ask them all the time for stuff on countries and for school assignments. So I had built up, um, I had built up uh, people that I knew contacts at National Geographic. Mm. Uh, again, Tom was like, Are you kidding me? National Geographic, man, that's like, awesome. Call them up. So I called my the head guy that I knew, and they had just finished a book with China called Journey into China it was a magnificent mm. best selling book here in America uh, that was gorgeous book that was put out by the National Geographic Society. So I called Chuck on that. He was the head of the book department. I said, Chuck, would you, 
would you write a letter for me asking if I could cycle the Great Wall of China? Again, well, Kevin, that's the craziest idea I've ever heard. See, I'm always crazy. Everybody says I'm crazy, you know, but he says, okay, I'll write you a letter. Let's see how far you can go with it. And those two letters, boom, that was it. They were sent to China, to Beijing. And within, I think, four months, the permission came. They're like, okay, you could, you can give it a try. So you see the power of your contacts. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so you were able to ride 2,000 miles of that Great Wall. Um, and the Great Wall is uh, about 5,500 miles long. To what did you do to prepare for that trip? I think I heard in the short you ran, got into the accident right before you biked yeah. the wall. Yeah, I um, I was training. Cannondale became mm -hmm. my the bicycle became my first sponsor. Mm -hmm. So I just started training around Connecticut. You know, I just ride miles just every day, ride miles. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's like Russian roulette. I mean, it's, uh, eventually you're going to get hit. And I got hit by a truck and uh, that did not go over well. And it was like just before I was to go to China. And so then that made the papers that I got hit by a truck. I had a concussion. I'm, I'm in bed in a dark room for six weeks uh, trying to recover. So we had to postpone the trip. And uh, at that time, um, the Olympic Cycling Committee uh, heard about the story and they just knew what I was doing. And the Olympic cycling coach up at Lake Placid, uh, New York, uh, said, this guy needs some training. You, you know, he basically he, he called and he told me, he said, you will never get through this. You will never get through this. You will die if you do not get some training. And so I went up to Lake Placid and uh, received some training. I also had to learn how to eat, too, because... Mm -hmm. That was another thing. Uh, so I had to build up my eating, which I, up, up there, that's all you do is eat. You eat and cycle. That's it. And um, I was eating six meals a day, putting in eight, eight to 10,000 calories a day. You, you have, that's your fuel. You know, you have yeah. to learn how to eat in order to cycle, in order to burn it off and the correct way to cycle and stuff like that. So I learned that. And then after that, I needed to get the height. I needed to get elevation uh, in me. And so uh, he said, my coach said, either Colorado or California, either either one they have and, and start cycling in the mountains and start getting that, that um, elevation training. So I did that for like the next year, two, let me see, two, two years, I did that. Wow. And then, uh, and, and, and so by the time we were finally able to go to China to do this, I, I was, I was ready. I mean, I was, I was so primed. My, the, my body was in the best shape that it could be mentally. I was focused, uh, physically I was good and, you know, I was ready to do it, but, but still, even though I had 18 years to, to get ready, you know, reading, I had three years to train for this. Nothing prepares you until you get out there. And especially in the Gobi desert, where mm -hmm. you start, we start, it's 130 degrees and, uh, and, and the sands and the winds and the, and the terrain. And it's, it's like, I'm, I'm going to freaking die out here. You know, I mean that I, I figured I would die because I had to kind of make a, make a will before I left. Mm. And, uh, you know, I just figured I wasn't coming back and my family, you know, my parents, you're crazy. You know, you're going to die out there. And I just said, you know what, I, I'd rather die for a dream, going after a dream. I'd rather die than, than to just live a life of existence. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, I was so obsessed, you know, or possessed. I was like mm -hmm. demon possessed. I was great wall possessed. So I needed like an exorcism. I needed, I needed to get, I, I said, look, if, if I don't do this, I'm going to go crazy. I'm just going to go crazy for the rest of my life. I have to do this no matter what, even if it's the last thing that I would do. And I almost died a few times out there. So, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was a, a harrowing adventure. Uh, yeah. In the short, you mentioned you had broken ribs, uh, you know, so what was it that, that, motivated you to finish this was it it was it like you said you know if you didn't finish this it would just drive you crazy <laughs> yeah what, I mean, what was motivating you while you were cycling through 
the, those 2,000 miles? Well, the biggest motivation, uh, well, one of the things is do not look at it as 2,000 miles. If you look at mm. it 2,000 miles, you're going to go crazy. You do No, we don't have 2,000 miles. All we have to do is get to the end. Just, just get to today. That's all just today. Mm. And, and that's it. We let's just put in a good. So I would talk to myself, um, in the mornings, I would, uh, I would listen to Bach. I like Bach. I like the music. Mm. So I have my little tape recorder on the great wall. I'm listening to Bach in the Gobi desert on the great wall. And that kind of, you know, kind of get into that meditation and, um, and the, and, 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 and the wall for me was like, we were infused together mm. you know i i always called her she so you know she's i'm i'm she's she's allowing me to to be with her today and we would talk and i know this sounds crazy but okay so i'm crazy all right we, we already established i'm crazy but um but i would talk to the wall like mm. like in the morning okay and i would say you know thank you for another day i'm so happy that that we could share this time together and, and we're going to get through today. And then at the end of the day, I would say, you know, I would look back at what I cycled and I would say, thank you. Uh, thank you for another day. That was really great. And I really look forward to getting up tomorrow and, and, you know, we're going to do it again. And, and uh, so that was, that was my way of getting through it day to day. But the other thing that really was my mantra uh, was Chairman Mao. And uh, Chairman Mao, and I say it in the documentary, but Chairman Mao, uh, one of the sayings is, if, if you uh, fail to reach the end of the wall, then you're not a man. And I'm like, and I, I admit this, that even at 30 years old, I was, I was more like a boy. Uh, you know, I went to China as a boy, but I came back as a man. Mm. And, and, and China gave me that, you know, the Great Wall gave me that. And mm. Chairman Mao gave me that by by this this verse and 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 i would almost like talk to, to chairman mao you know at night i'm like uh you know i i got through another day i'm, I'm getting i'm going to get closer someday someday i'm going to reach the end i'm going to reach the end of the wall and and i'm going to show you you know i'm this is my manhood this is my proof uh the other thing was i always said to myself if i if I could cycle the Great Wall of China, it was like a barrier, you know, like the walls in your mind. Mm. And, and so that's what the Great Wall was like a barrier, like this wall that I mean, we all put up walls in our yeah. minds. And my fear was always that my legs would go out from under me again, mm. and I would end up in the wheelchair. Mm. And, I, and I never wanted to go back to that wheelchair uh, when I was after the electrocution, when I was a kid, and and to me, I thought, you know, if I could, if I could get through the Great Wall, that is, I'll break down that barrier, I'll break down that wall in my mind, and when I complete this, I'm going to show Chairman Mao that I became a man and that I am never going back to that wheelchair again. And mm -hmm. so that's those are the things that kept me going day to day for two months. And do you have, I'm sure you might've already been asked this a million times, but do you have a favorite memory during that trip along the Great Wall? Well, my favorite memory is either uh, watching the sunrise or watching the sunset. I love mm. being wherever, I, whether it was the Gobi, well, the Gobi Desert's fantastic to see a sunset. I mean, just incredible. I've got pictures on my website of that. And, but, but then the other things are like when the terrain changes in the mountains and, and now you don't have the Gobi desert great wall. You have the mountain, the mountainous great wall, which, which is stone brick. And one of the things, of course it would be disheartening, but you you'd end the day and you'd be in the tower where you're going to be camping out that night. And you look to the horizon and you can see a week's worth of wall. I mean, snaking over the mountains, like, oh, okay, I'm going to be there tomorrow. I'm going to be over there uh, in two days. Oh, I'm going to be over there in three days. I mean, you could you could see a week's worth of wall that you have. That was a little disheartening. But when it became nighttime, night now, okay, it's quiet. The stars are out. Sometimes if there's a village nearby, you could hear the villagers below talking. The sounds would come up from the valley. And I, I felt like, wow, this must have been what it must have been like two, 3,000 years ago 
when when the guards were in those towers. I mean, they, they, those towers were used as homes for their families. And you could see yourself almost like being a guard 3,000 years ago. And it's a quiet, beautiful, starry night. And, and you, you're there with your own thoughts and you can hear the villagers below. And, and that to me was, those were, the, those were the positive memories. The negative memories are like the Gobi Desert and you're after a while taking your shoes off. So you pour the sand out of your shoe or, you know, you're eating sand or t- getting it out of your ears or wherever, um, or falling through the Great Wall or cracking three ribs or going through a hailstorm or a flash flood. Those were just the like worst times uh, because you're you're close to death uh, at that at those moments you don't and you don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen. Yeah. So you you said you know uh, completing that um, trip along the Great Wall, you came back as a man. You went there as a boy. You came back as a man. So it was definitely a pivotal point for you. Um, so then, can you talk a bit about what your bicycle symbolizes for you, right? Because uh, after that, you went on the America Summit tours. You you continued as an adventure cyclist. So does the bike also have significance in uh, kind of that wall you talked about of never going back to the wheelchair? Uh, what role does the bike ha- uh, play between, uh, what is your relationship with your bike? Because you then also carry that bike to all the places you went to, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the, I love the bicycle as, as a mode of, uh, not just a mode of transportation, but a mode of, um, how should I say, exploration. There are countries in the world where they don't even have vehicles, yet the bicycle is in every country in the world. I mean, you could find a, bike, a bicycle anywhere. So I like that aspect of it. For me, and I was naive at this point, I just want to cycle a great wall. I want to get it out of my system it's to say I did it. Mm-hmm. And then I was going back to my acting career because I, w- I was an, at that point, I was an actor on Broadway mm-hmm. and I, I'd done a couple of film parts and so I just want to get back to my acting career and that's it. Well, I, I became so famous with the Great Wall. I, I mean, like I said, it changed my life mm-hmm. that I, I couldn't get an audition because, well, you're not an actor, you're a cyclist, you're, you're an athlete. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not an athlete. I'm, I'm, I'm an actor. And, you know, I'm trying to get in these auditions and, and it's getting a little crazy. I said, well, you see, I'm an actor. I was an actor portraying the part of a cyclist. And now that part's done. And now I want a new part and I couldn't get it. And in the same time, I have to fulfill my uh, sponsors contract obligations mm. uh, and represent their, these are the products that did the great wall of China. So now I have to represent them and now I'm getting paid for it. And I didn't realize I was getting paid. Wow, I'm getting paid for this? You know, they pay you a, like a lot of money. I mean, uh, I remember, and we have to go like 30 years ago. If I got a regular job, regular 40 hours a week job, what I was making on personal appearances, I'd have to work two days at that in order to make what I would make in a year working. And I can't get an acting job. And now I've got, and then my manager saying, Kevin, you, you got your own helmet. You know, Bell Helmet was my sponsor. You got your own helmet sponsor. You got your own uniforms. You got your own bicycle. You, let's go do. And at, and then at that time, uh, Fidel Castro invited me to Cuba. Mm. I'm like, man, I'm going to Cuba. Yeah. And he, my manager was like, no, you're Captain America. You need a tour of America. Mm. And so we did that. But what I love is that with uh, my like my bicycle sponsor or my uniform. Mm-hmm. I could help design my own bicycles. I, I could have whatever I wanted on them. So they, they became very expensive because there are all these new parts, new things, new technology that was happening. Back then, 30 years ago, mountain biking was just exploding. So mm-hmm. they're coming out with all this different stuff. And I love that. I love being able to put it together. And so basically what I was doing was producing my own tours. And I had all these sponsors that gave me all this stuff for free. You know, they just here, here, Kevin, here, take our stuff. And I'm getting paid for this now. There's where my whole life changes. So I'm like six months after coming back from the Great Wall of China, my manager calls me and says, guess what? You just won the Cyclist of the Year Award over Greg LeMond. And Greg just won his third Tour de France 
a month after I came back from the Great Wall. And I'm like, I'm no cyclist. And he says, you are now. Let's go make some money. And I'm like, I threw up my hands. And that was like the last straw when I won the Cyclist mm. of the Year. I said, OK, fine. I'm a cyclist. And they're OK. <laughs> I'll think of a tour of America. And, and, and that was it for the 90s. You know, mm. Really, I kind of fell into it by accident. So you continue playing the role of a cyclist. <laughs> yes, it was it was a twelve year it was a twelve year role. That was it. It was like a it was like a TV series. Right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I was glad to retire after, after that. And you know, out of all the places you've been to, what would you say was one of your favorite places outside of the Great Wall? <laughs> yeah, outside of the Great Wall, I love. I mean, I. I was so crazy about the Great Wall. I said, I told my teammates, I said, listen, if I die, bury me in the Great Wall. Just bury me there. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I, I, I'd have been happy as having the Great Wall as my tombstone. I love the world. I love, I love mm. traveling. You, you know, uh, Kim loves it as well. Every moment is an, an adventure. Every place that we go to is an adventure. And uh, I, I never got to see my own country until I did American Summits. Mm -hmm. uh, which was to go to all 50 states and and just wow just being able to get in a van again donated by bell helmets they did this incredible you know custom made touring van for me and that tour took two years and i just traveled around the country going from state to state cycling from state to state uh doing the high points and getting to meet such a diversity of people that mm -hmm. i never knew before even like living in my own country uh so that's you know that was wonderful cuba cuba was fantastic i love cuba uh going to these little towns uh cuba is about the size of california and just zigzagging throughout cuba for three weeks that i did and meeting the people see i that's part of the bicycle you know the bicycle is the the, the way to explore and you get to meet all these different cultures mm -hmm. and, and you get to meet all these different people. And we're pretty much all, all alike, you know, we all get mm -hmm. along and, you know, Hey, they invite you to their house and here, have a, have a meal with us, have a drink with us. And, and it's great. And I love, I, I love that uh, camaraderie, camaraderie uh, uh, with that. And, and that's, that's kind of like uh, wherever we go. Kim and, Kim and I, I mean, she'll hold me back a, a little bit. I, I might get, you know, too gregarious. Uh, that's, that's the Italian in me, but that's, that's why I have Kim. She, she can hold me back a bit and, you know, keep, keep me, keep me on the leash a little bit. I remember you said you loved the beaches in Cuba. Oh, mm. love the beaches. No one on the beach, pristine. Oh. unspoiled unspoiled mm. unspoiled and, land <laughs> yeah and and is that why you call yourself an adventure cyclist because it's more about the adventure than it is about the cycling for you yeah it is um i i was never a racer you, you, mm -hmm. you know i i just yeah i i would ask my friends okay like greg and some of the other racers and and these guys are making like again you got to go back 30 years okay yeah and they're making like a million dollars a year it, racing a bike you know, from race to race to race, the same races every year, every year, you do the same thing every year. Like, I'm like, I go crazy. And I say, guys, how, how do you keep it? Like, how do you motivate? What's the motivation? Yeah. They said the money. And, <laughs> you know, I, I never wanted that to be the motivation. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. the money's nice, you know, it gives you a nice life, but I'm like, man, I just cannot race. That is just, that bores me to tears. I, I want to take the bike where a bicycle has never been gone, wherever. Mm. And, uh, and that's what attracted me. And after the Great Wall, I actually, I actually wanted to, um, you know, like I said, cycle the moon. And, mm -hmm. and that was um, when I was doing a tour for my sponsors. Back in 1990, after I came back, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. And so I made an appointment with NASA. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went to NASA, their, their headquarters in, in D.C., and and I, I said, uh, what will it take for me and a bicycle? Get, you get me and a bicycle up on the moon and back. And so we, um, we sat down for like 90 minutes. I wish I had a recording of that meeting. And we all sat down with the engineers and they're figuring out like, okay, how much is, is the bike going to weigh and what we're going to do? And, you know, they were, uh, they, where were we going to launch me and all that? And, uh, and they said, after 90 minutes, they said, okay, here's what we, 
if Kevin, if you can raise five billion dollars, we can get you on the moon in three years. I said, okay. Oh, and guys, I'm bringing the bicycle back because you know, I'm, and you know, I'm going to have all that moon dust on my tires and stuff. I'm bringing the bike back because it's going to be worth something. And uh, I said, okay, five billion. All right, five billion. Then, and I'm thinking, like, who who can I ask for five billion dollars at that time in 1990? So I'm ready to leave, and and the director of NASA, he. He, he takes me and said, before he walks me out the door, he, he, we veer off to his office. We go to his office and he says, listen, Kevin, I don't know if you can raise 5 billion or not. Okay. <laughs> but you're the guy who cycled the Great Wall of China. So I'm ready to believe anything. So listen, if you can raise $5 billion, forget the moon. We'll send you to Mars instead. I said, <laughs> really? Mars? Well, how can you do that? Because I'm thinking like fuel. Like, yeah. would you need more fuel? No, no, no. We just need the fuel to break you out of Earth's atmosphere. After that, we can point you anywhere we want and you're just going to go. Oh, okay. But doesn't it take like nine months to go to Mars? And they said, yeah. Okay. So nine months to Mars, nine months back. I said, listen, if I'm going to go to, if we're going to go to Mars, I want to be on Mars for at least six months. I want to get my money's worth. And uh, they said, okay, we'll do it. So that was always in the back. You know, I always said the moon, but if we got the money, I was going to like, okay, scrap the moon. We're going to Mars. That was it. So you see, this is the kind of crazy life that I have that that you could like just dream anything and, and like do do anything. And, you know, anything is possible. And your sense of adventure, you know, you mentioned your mom a lot um, reading you that Encyclopedia Britannica mm-hmm. every night. Have uh, the places that you've been visited before, you know, have they been inspired by stories from those evenings of reading from the Encyclopedia Britannica <laughs> at all? Or just um, maybe realizing a dream that your mom was ne- never able to fil- fulfill herself? Yeah, well, definitely my mother is is an influence uh, in me. You know, it's, it's funny, the the, the people who have influenced me and the, the people who have shaped my life have all been women. And, mm. you know, it, it like never men, but it's always been the women, starting with my mother. Kim is an influencer. You know, she she makes me uh, want to be a better man than sometimes I am. So um, so she was definitely a big influencer as a child, but she never, like she said, listen, Kevin, all you can do is ask anybody for anything and all they can do is say no. Now, I don't think she meant that as my life mission, but I took it seriously and like, okay, I'm going to ask the president and Chairman Mao to cycle the Great Wall of China. Okay, I'm going to talk to NASA. I mean, look, I talked to NASA about going to cycle the moon and they offer me Mars. How great is that? Man, that is so that's so cool. You know, so that's what I tell that to people. I tell that to kids and others. It's like, just ask, just, ask. I mean, all they can do is say no. And if they say no, who cares? Go on to the next one until someone does say yes on that. So, so yeah, when my mother tucked me into bed and the bed, she made like an envelope and she put the blanket up here and I was like, okay, okay. You're in the envelope. Okay. Where are we going to go to tonight? You know, what country are we going to travel? And then she would tell me these stories from the encyclopedia Britannica uh, these different countries and places until I fell asleep and okay, go off to your, you know, I mean, I know there's a children's story in there somewhere, it, you know, there's, children, there's a children's book in there somewhere, you know, that's what it was to me. I, I never, mm-hmm. uh, I have three siblings. Mm-hmm. They all have nine to five jobs. They all, you know, they, they have normal lives. Uh, I, I've, I've never had a normal life. So, you know, why start now? I like to have fun. I mean, yeah. look, look, one time, you got one time on the merry-go-round, okay? One ride on the merry-go-round, you need to make it count. And this is, so when I'm, when I go, when it's, it's my time is done, I could look back and go, man, I've, I've had a really good life. I mean, I've gotten to do a lot of things that most people never have and probably never will. I mean, I will, I will probably live out my life being the only person to cycle the Great Wall of China. And that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Very cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, you also talk um, about your father in the short, you know, he's, yeah. uh, I wouldn't say obviously, but definitely had an impact um, on your life. Um, and, you know, uh, wanted to ask, is your dad, do you think because you were such a dreamer, is, do you think that my, is that why maybe that 
it was just so hard for him to understand you. And have you kind of um, made peace with your relationship with your dad? And maybe it wasn't a good influence for you, but maybe it was a motivator for you to prove to him that you could do what you wanted to do. <laughs> well, sure. I, uh, Kim and I have talked about that. And she's, what's interesting is Kim has pointed out a lot of uh, things about me that even I didn't know because she's looking at it from a person outside the circle and she can point some stuff out to me. And I'm like, wow, you know, I never, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is so, which is so great because it, it adds another piece to my puzzle that I didn't have. But, uh, you know, I have to have to look back and I have to like, look back at my parents. They, they were born in a different time. They're, they're like, you grow up, you get a good education, you then get a good job with benefits, eventually you retire, you know, you get married, you raise a family. And I mean, that's it. Dang, that's boring. You know, yet my siblings have that, you know, my siblings went through that, but, uh, but all three of them went to college. I've never gone to college, but yet I've had, you know, to me, I've had the most fun. I never worry about money. I mean, at this point, I don't have to anymore, but you know, I never did then. I said, well, you know, it'll come, it'll happen. You know, I remember with my father. So I come back from the Great Wall. I'm making mm -hmm. personal appearances. I happen to be in my area, my hometown area. I thought I'd stop by, see my father. That was a, definitely a no-no. You, you, don't, you don't go see my father without an appointment. So I, I did not call the secretary. I didn't call the secretary. I didn't have an appointment. I just show up. She doesn't even know who I am. Well, who are you? You don't have an appointment. Oh, well, tell him his son is here. I didn't know he had another son. So anyway, uh, I, I go there. Kim, can you kind of talk a, a little bit about what next steps look like for you? You know, this short was amazing, very inspirational to watch. I can imagine, I can only imagine how much footage, um, you know, uh, archival footage you had to dig up. Well, let me start with, there was about 80 hours of footage. <laughs> because originally we were Don't thinking about cover. doing a feature documentary Need phone number? so Need to number. go through 80 hours of footage and pare that down to 39 minutes was quite a challenge I can imagine. a thousand Three. cuts Three, four, in zero, the zero. film so you know in that even yep. though it's 39 yeah, minutes, I think most I mean, people would agree that it moves does. really quickly. Nice. And part of the reason is because there are so many cuts so in, that, in that film. So um, we are still working on uh, turning it into a feature film. But you know, over the last year with COVID, that's kind of uh, slowed things down. <laughs> uh, right now. Not sure. We're working on another yeah, short documentary down called uh, A Perfect Love, you know, you know. and it's uh -huh. about uh, an American family, an American couple, and their two biological children. I'm over here. They uh, adopted six special needs children from China over a period of eight years. Mm from 2008 to 2016. And we uh, flew out to Nashville, picked up our director and went to Kentucky in July, interviewed the family. And we hope to have that. It's gonna be another short documentary, maybe about 30 minutes or just under that. We hope to have that documentary done by the end of next summer. So we're working on that at the moment and moving forward. Um, and for those who are watching this after uh, they watch the short, uh, is there social media handles, websites they can follow to be to stay up to date with your progress on the film or anything else that uh, you or Kevin are working on? Well, I think if they're interested in in knowing more about his story, they can check out, if they're able to get on YouTube, they can check out YouTube and just Kevin Foster, Great Wall. There's old interviews uh, on there from television networks. Uh, he was on a game show, oh, uh, wow. you know, <laughs> at one point. So there's a lot of footage on online there. Okay. Um, they can check that out. Um, Gloria, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Uh, thank you. There was a, such a um, such a journey to watch the film and uh, listen in. So uh, yeah, so I, I actually worked for Chris Dodd. Yeah. Right. When did you work for him? What years? So I worked for Jack Valenti too. So I met him in person. Oh, okay. So that was uh, yeah. 13 years in MPA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, now I, I'm a, now I, I left the job and I basically mm -hmm. 
settled down in Seattle. So the movie uh, I show I show to uh, my son and his classmate. There are about four mm -hmm. or five boys yesterday, and uh, I think this movie, it this uh, documentary, is very uh, encouraging. You know, in terms of the cultural difference, in terms of the uh, the mountain bike. I mean, they all like bicycling these days, and uh, also the spirit Kevin has, and also you know the transformation after just like himself uh, talked about it. You know, elaborate in this uh, dialogue how much he changed, how much this but adventure changed him, and mm -hmm. uh, he become a real man. So that was, um, I think, a lot of. Uh, details. I mean, I, I recommend he write the book. <laughs> Chat with yeah, my nobody friend. wants it. <laughs> no, I think, no, I think there would be a lot to say. Write your tiny yeah. English, and uh, I'm sure that if, if bilingual book, that's uh, it's good for young people. You know, it yeah. will. will oh. Gloria, how old are your sons? Your son and his friends? Oh, uh, they're they're thirteen. They're about eighth grade. Here. Yeah. Okay, middle. so they're uh, they're around the age that Kevin was. He was twelve when he yeah. first had that dream to cycle the wall. Yeah. So I actually uh, ask each of them what's their takeaway. You know, what which mm. which part you get uh, impressed, or which part you like, and uh, but we didn't talk too much i mean i i was com i was confused why your father was um was uh, treat you or how to say he, he doesn't really s recognize as much as i think so i don't know that part but i think today you touch a little bit so basically it's a generation you know back then everybody it's like a asian chinese right they, they always have a lot of pre pressure on their children but you yeah. know he, you know, the children is themselves. So they will grow whatever into their own identity. And you are I would say, a, I would say a couple of things about Kevin's dad. He was British. Mm -hmm. And so he was much more formal, right? In his expectations mm -hmm. and traditional in his expectations. And Kevin was the oldest son. Uh -huh. And for, you know, Europeans and British, especially, that's really important. Like the oldest son carries on the traditions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he felt also that he could, he wanted to be an English professor, but he felt like he was never able to realize that dream for himself. So he settled to become an accountant. You know, he settled to, on doing that. And so he had convinced himself mm -hmm. that dreams don't come true for people like himself or like Kevin. So I think when Kevin actually did cycle the wall, mm -hmm. he still didn't congratulate him. Yeah. You know, he never said he was proud of him. I think part of that is just if he were to admit you actually can realize your dream if you are really devoted to achieving it, then it would completely go, you know, deny what he had been telling himself the whole time. And and so he would feel like a failure, right? So I think mm. he was so proud, so prideful that he could, you know, acknowledge it. That's just my yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good that's a good summary of it. I mean, you know, I remember when uh, when I got permission and I was called to the office, almost like you know, I'm this bad boy. I'm called to the principal's office, and uh, my my father calls me to to come by the office or we were talking or something office, like that. Yeah. And he said, once I got permission, he said, you know what? I don't know who's crazier, you or the Chinese government to give you permission to cycle the wall. So, you know, it was like that. When I started getting sponsors, after I got the permission, I started getting sponsors. My father was like, they're paying you for this? Yeah, you know, welcome to America. Y yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, he couldn't, he couldn't understand. And then when I came back, now, now this is crazy. I came back. I'm doing personal appearances. I happen to be home at the time I go by and see him. It's now September. Okay, September. You got four months to the end of the year at this point, four months. And my father's like, well, no, well, now that you've done this silly, stupid dream of yours, you need to get a real job. A real job back then was paying, I think, $3 an hour. I, I said, uh, I, I can't afford to get a job. You know, it, it, not a real job. I can't afford it. You know, I have expenses and things. And so he was like, how much are you getting paid? And I'm trying to tally up what I'm going to get paid from that point to the end of the year. Okay, so I got four months. Well, how much am I getting? Let me see. Okay, I got this, I got this. So I got to get this. Uh, and I, I basically rounded off and I said something like, um, 
uh, $85,000. He was like, well, that's not enough. Are you kidding me? I, I got four months. I'm going to be, I'm going to get like $85,000. And if I got a real job at $3 an hour, there's no way I could make that kind of money, you know, in, in the next four months. And, and then like within a year, I surpassed him, you, you know, in money. I surpassed him. He went nuts. He, he, he went crazy. He was like, I don't believe that you don't even have an education. How can you be worth more than me? You know? And I, again, I'm like, this is America. Okay. This is it. You know, welcome to America. And uh, yeah, we, it, it, it was just a hard concept for him. And the, the other thing was, I, I kind of think it's funny not from his point of view, but um, <laughs> he's trying to get away from me. He doesn't want to hear it, right? He, he goes to the office, he, especially after the Great Wall of China. He goes to the office, he turns on the radio. I'm doing an interview on the radio. There, he hears my voice, you know, okay, turn that <laughs> off. Or he gets the paper that day and there I am in the newspaper on some story. Or he, he, after, uh, after he's done working, he goes home, he goes to dinner, he, he turns on the news or he turns on the TV. I'm on TV. So like he could not get away from me for a while. He's like, he's everywhere. He tell my siblings, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. You know, I can't believe this. So it, it, um, it really irked him um, uh, that, that you that, succeeded. That I succeeded <laughs> yeah. that, that my, yeah. that it grew, my success grew and grew and grew over the nineties on, on uh, stuff like this. Uh, but what was interesting this was interesting. He died. My sister is cleaning out his office. And at the, at the bottom of one of his desk drawers, he's got this full page interview on me that he kept like hidden away. I thought that was interesting. I mean, Kim, Kim talks about it or asks about it in the documentary, but uh, I, I thought, and she sent it to me and I'm like, wow, isn't that weird? He, he, he's like always cursing me and uh, couldn't stand it. But yet he had hidden this full page uh, story about me and, and kept it. So, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a weird thing. I think for most of us, it's like hard to understand why, you know, a, a father would not be proud mm -hmm. of their son for achieving something like that or, or would not change their position, you know, after uh, Kevin succeeded in writing the wall, but instead it's like he dug his heels in even harder. Yeah. And again, I think it's just that he felt like if he acknowledged it, it would be invalidating his whole story that he told himself all his life about what was true. It was, uh, it was such a touching uh, moment. And uh, um, you, you talk about uh, so many details. I highly recommend you put the, you write the book, you know. <laughs> Seriously. Not only could he write a book, but he, when he was on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, he kept a audio journal. Oh. So he has yeah. like, how many tapes do you have? 80 About tapes 40, or something like that? 40, 40 uh, tapes. Okay. 40 tapes of, you know, just my thoughts. recording his thoughts each day that he was writing along the wall. So I've always thought that, you know, taking some of that because, you know, as time goes by, you forget a lot yeah. of those details, but taking some of his thoughts when he was actually writing the wall and integrating that into his story in a book would be great. And have you recently listened to these audio files yourself, Kevin? No, I have never heard them since 1990. So <laughs> oh. we, did, we, we did get them. We did get them digitized. Yeah, we did get them yeah. be, before the tape, you know, uh, broke or, <laughs> or something yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> so when we were doing the documentary, we digitized everything. We digitized all the film that I had from China. We digitized the uh, the slides that I had uh, and, and the 40, 90 minute tapes. And we thought, well, if we could, if I could listen through them on some of them, but I'm like, wow, that's, that's like monumental for me to have to listen or even have transcribed 40, 90 minute cassette tapes. Cause it's, it's really almost, it, it's, it, it's almost, I think one tape every couple of days when I'm on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, just, just talking, just whatever I was feeling. Sometimes I was saying, Lord, I, I don't know if I'm going to get out of this alive, but at least the tapes, if I do die, the tapes will, will, will be there as a, as a memory, as you know, someone that, that will know my, my thoughts, because I think a lot of people wouldn't understand how could this guy do what he wanted to do, knowing that he could die? Why would he do something like that? And I don't think people understand that 
the dream becomes so big. It becomes bigger than yourself. You just have, you have no choice. You know? And that's what I was telling my father. I, I, I said, you know, I just, I just don't have a choice. I, I have to do this. I don't know why I'm compelled to do this. And then of course he said, well, if you're compelled to do this and you do it, then I'm, I'm going to be compelled to uh, cut you out of the family, uh, which he did, you know, he cut me out of the will. And so uh, my three siblings got all the inheritance, but I was like, you know, it's fine because I was blessed by what I received. You know, it's not, mm-hmm. like, I mean, yes. I mean, everybody could always use an extra million dollars, but you know um, I said, you know, it's fine. It, it's better for me that I made it on my own and not, you know, that way. And, and are you um, in contact with your siblings still? Um, how is your relationship with your siblings? That wasn't really touched upon in the short Yeah. Well, you saw Amy, my baby sister. Mm -hmm. Um, The way it goes is boy, girl, boy, girl, about two Mm -hmm. years apart. So Amy and I are, are close because we, we actually, in a way we grew up together. Uh, She was seven weeks old when I had the accident. Mm -hmm. So my mother is changing two sets of diapers, her Mm -hmm. oldest and her youngest. And Amy and I learned to walk together. You know, we were fed at the same time. We were bathed at the same time. We had our diapers changed at the same time. Although I'm eight years old, or, you know, the body is eight or whatever. And she's, you know, seven weeks, eight weeks. And so we're closer. And my two other siblings, my, the two middle ones, my sister and my brother, uh, I haven't talked to them, seen them since 1995. It's just the way it is. You know, they mm-hmm. took my father's side, my, the older of the two sisters, Kimberly, she, um, she would always talk to my mother and say, what's wrong with Kevin? Why can't he get a real job? How come he can't be normal like the rest of us? You know, my mother would have to say, Kimberly, you don't understand. He was electrocuted. You, he went through a horrific accident. It changed him. It just changed him to, to what he is today. Uh, my brother follows my sister and, oh, whatever, you know, whatever she says. And the other thing, an optimist cannot survive in, within a group of pessimists. You know, mm-hmm. they, they can't. I mean, I mean, look, I have nothing against my siblings. They have normal jobs. They're married. They have children. They have a normal life. I mean, that's great. That's what you want. That's great. I, I didn't have that. I, I'm just, I just wanted to experience all that life had to offer. I've been given that chance and it's just, it's just great to, you know, be able to experience what this world has to offer and, and to yeah. see and to get to know the different cultures and, yeah. And different things like that. And, and I just, you know, I, w- I just wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for a normal life. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing, Kevin, yes. have, has anyone ever told you that your story is similar to Forrest Gump? So if Forrest Gump was yes. a real life person. Ever since Forrest Gump came out, uh-huh. uh, the LA Times was the first one publicly to make that simulation. So, you know, when you, when you get from the LA Times saying, (laughs) this is the real life Forrest Gump, you know, it's hard to live it down. I can't. (laughs) And it, and it went all over the wire service. Oh, So I was like, uh, I said, you know, I like Captain America better, but you you really (laughs) like the Forrest, you like Forrest Gump. No, I have more of an intelligence. (laughs) So yes, I, uh, yes, I, I've heard that many times okay (laughs) the big the big difference is with Forrest Gump he fell he just fell into things yeah you know it just came his way yeah with with Kevin he had to work super hard for everything yes (laughs) I like I like to say that that's what I used to say to my father nothing was given to me I worked for Mm -hmm. everything there's something really good about that yeah hand it to you but you, you work for it you figure out you figure out well how how am I going to make this come true? Right. Uh, you know, but uh, my my uh, father, he's probably right. I'm, I'm sure he's right about this. I, I just have this knack for talking other people into my vision, mm. you, you know, and talking people into, hey, I have an idea. And oh, no, I don't want to hear it. But um, like, oh, this is really <laughs> great. And, and people just kind of gravitate toward that. Yeah, let's all go have fun and let's do it. And let's see if we can do it. And Chris Dodd, National Geographic, Tom Williams, some of these people, uh, when I came back, they said, Evan, we never thought you'd get this far. And I said, hey, you know, or with the press when when things were happening and I got hit by a truck or this, it's like, I would say, unless I'm dead, I'm moving forward. You, yeah. you know, that's, 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 you're, you're just not going to stop me. That's all there is to it. And that's, that's the way I, I am. I, I, I 
can't help myself. And, um, and I, I, when I go and speak with kids, teenagers and kids and stuff like that, I, I kind of give them the analogy. I said, do you remember when you had to cross the street and it was really scary and your mother or your father would say, take my hand? Okay, you're going to take my hand and, and like, now let's look both ways for the traffic. Let's look both ways. Boom, boom, boom. And okay, we're going to cross. Let's go. No traffic. Let's going to go. And you made it. You made it across the street and you didn't yeah. get hit by a car. <laughs> well, someday you have to cross the street by yourself without holding anybody's hand. And you did it and you cross the street. And then you say, you know, that wasn't so bad. Well, I think I could do that again. And then you, you do it. You just kind of keep doing it, doing it like breathing. And then you don't think about it anymore. It's the same way with turning a dream into a reality. It's a dream. Here's the dream. There's a reality. Once you do it, once you complete a dream that you turn into reality, it's like, well, that wasn't so bad. Oh, okay. I, I, I got that. I, I understand now. And then you do it again and you do it again. And then like with me after 30, 40 years, it's, it becomes second nature to you now. I'm, I'm, I, I like to say I'm more than a dreamer. I'm, I'm more of a realistic dreamer mm. because I, I see the dream and I say, okay, what do we need to turn this into reality and then go do it? And don't listen to the negativity. I didn't get to ask you that part yet. <laughs> Today. Okay. I wanted to keep it more positive. <laughs> well, that's positive. All right. One last question to wrap up our Q and A. What is next for you, Kevin? Uh, you know, you, uh, you mentioned Mars. I don't know if that's still kind of in the back. Back of your pocket plans. Yeah, I, go. I would go. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you got to write a letter to Jeff Bezos or. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> After I retired, I went back, not so much as my acting roots, but I, I did go back to some of my acting roots, but also as producing, producing mm -hmm. writing, some of that. And um, Kim and I, uh, right now, we're involved in, we, we just got another, uh, and I don't know it was my fault, but we, we got another producing job, another documentary. Um, it was really my fault. I was talking to, I said, you know, you have a really good story there. And I, I think you should like make a documentary out of it. You should do this, do, you know, and, oh, Kevin, that's a wonderful idea. Here, go do it. I'm like, I don't want to do this, you know? Um, no, I don't want to do it. No, no, you do it because because the Against the Wall has really, I don't know. I mean, it just took off. Uh, we've we've won a lot of awards uh, from it. Uh, we've, we've been able to go all over the country and parts of the world. It was a big hit in China. That was That was fantastic for us. And, and so, so much came, I mean, it, it, it got uh, qualified for last year's Oscars, uh, mm -hmm. the Academy Award. So anyway, we, we kind of got into, well, I told Kim, I mean, once it happened, I had to tell Kim, oh, uh, uh, we have a job for the next two years. And, you know, oh, we do? Yes, yes, we do. And uh, so, uh, so we're working on that and it's called uh, A Perfect Love. And it's about American families who adopt special needs Chinese children. Or children from China, you know? mm. and uh, so we've been doing some filming on that uh, so far uh, with this American family for it, and and um, and so again, you know, have fun, have fun yeah. with it. If you if you don't, uh, then that, and that's my philosophy. I mean, if you can't have fun doing something, go do something else. I, you know, <laughs> have fun. If it's not fun, then why do it? Then it's work. Work is a lousy word. Play is better. <laughs> Play is a good word. Work is a, is a bad word. Okay, so this is it. Now, if your work can become play, oh man, you won. That's it. You got it. Yep. That's the way it is. And, and Kim can take off from there on what she <laughs> wants to add to it. I actually, I, I did speak about the other documentary we're working on. Okay. Um, and we um, prepared a, a preview, five minute preview. We weren't planning. We were only planning to do one minute. Really has moved a lot of people. And so- we're looking forward to completing the documentary mm -hmm. at the end of the summer next year. All right. Well, I want to thank you both so much for uh, your time tonight. It was amazing to hear even greater stories and details from Kevin yourself. <laughs> uh, look forward to possibly a book, and, uh, <laughs> but definitely looking forward to that feature film uh, down the Me line too. for you. <laughs> All right. And uh, All right. happy Mid-Autumn Festival. Yes, happy Mid-Autumn <laughs> Festival. Thank you both. Thanks for having us, okay. Victoria. <laughs>